Guten Morgen, guten Tag, guten Abend. So let's go over how to read Frakturschrift. It's called die Fraktur or Frakturschrift. So it's the this type of font. It's called um, black letter font in English. And so eine Schriftart in der Kategorie der gebrochenen Schriften. So black letter or gothic scripts sometimes. And so it's a it's a font, schrift art is font. So a font in the category of the broken scripts, you could say. It's a broken font. And we'll see in a moment why it's called that. And then it comes from Lati Latinish, so Latin fraktura means bruch, which is a, a, a break, right, or gebrochen. So of course fra fracture, obviously it means fracture or break. So that's why it's called... Um, a gebrochener Schrift, a broken script, script, and then you can see it's called fracture, uh, fracture as in Fraktur. So um, we have uh, from 16th bis zum Anfang des 20th Jahrhunderts. So it uh, was used in Germany, uh, in German-speaking areas, from the beginning, uh, from the 16th to the beginning of the 20th century. And you can imagine what happened around the middle of the 20th century. Uh, that meant that uh, this this characteristically German script fell out of favor. So, um, but many most most uh, books were printed in uh, one version or the other of a uh, Frakturschrift up until the middle of the 20th century. So, um, here's one version that you can actually uh, download for free. It's called Kleist Fraktur. Kleist was uh, is one of uh, one of the darlings of, of German literature. He was a, he lived from 1777 to 1811, and he um, is one of everybody's favorite authors. So they named this uh, script after him. So they called it the Kleist Fraktur. Um, kostenlos herunterladen, so you could download it for free. And then, welche Buchstaben finden Sie merkwürdig? Asking you, which letters do you find uh, notable or interesting? Um, so here are, this is a, this is just a, a computerized version. This isn't, this isn't exactly what you would get if you, you know, read a real text in Frakturschrift, but this is, it's an approximation based on what our computers can do nowadays. So you can see, um, the capital letters are usually quite a struggle. And this version, this sort of user-friendly version has them looking a little bit more like you might expect, but the A still looks very strange. Like if you, uh, if you see it, you know you know it's A B C D, so you know the context. So you can you can tell that's an A because it's right before the B and the C, and so um, it's probably not too hard to recognize right now that this is an A. But if you saw that and you didn't know what the rest of the word was or just by itself, uh, that would be a little bit harder. It looks kind of like a U or maybe an H or something, right? Um, and then the B is is pretty easy. The C and the D. The G might be a little strange, um, and the H is, I think, very strange because it looks more like a lowercase h, right? And then here we see in in this computerized version, this is one example of how um, this is different from real uh, real uh, black letter because in real black letter, the I and the J are exactly the same, um, and then the O might be very strange. It looks a little bit like a D. The P, it looks a little kind of like a D as well. And then um, the Q, just barely different from the O, just a tiny thing. And then um, the S is a little bit strange. And then um, the V, I feel, is, is pretty hard to recognize um, unless you already know what the word is. And then um, you wouldn't see a capital Y very often. And then um, with these, we have the D is sometimes hard for people, the way it just barely has a top there. And then the F and the S is always a struggle. But here in this, uh, you know, downloadable font version, the F and the S are completely different. And we'll talk about that in a moment, why uh, there's two versions of the S is why. So um, the F and the S are totally easy to, to distinguish here. But in when you read a real text, um, that won't be so easy. But the K is very strange. Even they maintained... The K, so the K and the T is sometimes a struggle. There's the K, um, and then there's the T. And then, um, yeah, the X and the Y are pretty strange. Yeah. So um, let's look at, so the, dieser Computer sagt der Frakturschrift ist nicht ganz richtig. It's not, so this computer version of the, of the uh, black letter is not quite right. It's not entirely right. Beim, zum Beispiel beim langen und runden S. So uh, here we have a screenshot of a real of a real printed Frakturschrift, 
And so what we have is two types of S. We have the long S and the round S. So the long S is like in Faustus right here, Faustus. So in the middle of a word, in the beginning or the middle of a word, you're going to get this long S, and it looks a lot like an F. Um, like here's darauf. This one is actually an F. Darauf. So there's an F. But here, this next word is zakte. Zaktus. This is an S. So look at the difference between this F, darauf, and this S, zakte. So um, the difference between an F and an S is just this tiny little thing on the front. So it's where the F is crossed, right? But it's just so small and it looks uh, very, very similar. So Darauf sagte Dr. Faustus. And so at the beginning of a word like sagte and then in the middle of a word like Faustus, we're going to get that long S. But then at the end of a word, we're going to get the round S, rundes S. So this S at the end of Faustus is called the round S, and that's, uh, they're both S's, it's just they occur in different lexical situations. So um, what happens here is that in this computer version, they're just using the round S the entire time, because you can't have two separate ones, um, so they just, they went with the round S. So that's an example of something that you can't do today, but when they, you know, when they, when they were actually printing these, they had two separate um, uh, little parts of the drawer, you know, like the drawer with the font in it that they would put into the printing press. So um, they had two different little uh, compartments for the two different S's. Um, so let's look at the development of the fonts. Entwicklung der Schriftarten, the development of the fonts. So I have um, the oldest version. Um, these, there are many, many more, but these are the, broadly, these are the most important ones. Die Textura, which was from the 12th to the 14th century, and then Rotunda or Rundgotisch, which was 13th to 15th century. Schwabacher Schrift, we'll have lots of examples of those in a moment, um, of course, in the Reformation era, was very important. And then Fraktur came at the end of that, uh, that what we know today as Die Fraktur um, was very popular for many centuries. Yeah. Okay. So um, here we have examples of each of those. I have, you know, Textur, Rotunda, Schwabacher, and Fraktur. So you can see this last one, Fraktur. This is probably the one that seems most familiar to you because it's the one that was used uh, the longest and um, the most recently. So you can see Textura, Rotunda, Schwabacher, Fraktur. Textura, Rotunda, Schwabacher, Fraktur. So um, you can see they uh, they have a lot of similarities, but the Rotunda um, is is... I think more more different than the others, and then um, Schwabacher and Fraktur are, are pretty similar, but um, in general Schwabacher is a lot wider and Fraktur is skinnier. Um, and then of course the capital letters on the Textur, the capital letters are very distinct with all of their extra strokes. Yeah. So um, Unterschiede bei Bögen von, Gebrochen, von gebrochenen und runden Schriftarten. So this is differences um, of the the bows, as in the the uh, the parts that curve, right, um, between the broken and the round fonts, right. So Antiqua is a um, is what you call a round font because it has keine Bogenbrechung. There's no breaking of the of the curve. So it's just a curve. It's a normal curve. There's no breakage of the curve. And so on the O and on the M, keine Bogenbrechung, no, no breakage of this bowing curve area. But then we have Textura, uh, Bogenbrechungen. So it, what, what would be a, a curve is now broken. It's been broken off in parts. Yeah. So that's why it's called a broken script. And then Rotunda, uh, same thing, um, but it's only Bogenbrechung nur angedeutet. So the, the breakage is only hinted at. Angedeut is just, it's just a hint of breakage. It's not a full breakage, just, just a, a sharp bend, you could say. And then we have Schwabacher, which is like um, very broken. So, and then Fraktur, same thing. They have, they both have um, very distinct breakages. Um, so we have Textura. Here's an example of Textura, especially with, you can see how much more, um, how much more uh, rectangle it is. See with textura, it's just, it's very rectangle. 
Um, and so it's, uh, you can see, this is, um, of course, if you're not reading texts that are quite this old, then, um, then you don't necessarily have to practice this one too much, but uh, the, also the spelling is quite different. Of course, the further back you go, the more different the spelling is, so that's its own, its own skill to be learned as well, to um, recognize the spelling changes throughout the centuries. Here's um, rotunda, and you can see how much more round it is, obviously. So um, the, it's a very uh, big difference between this one and this one. But um, you can see, uh, and sometimes if it's in Latin, then that will be <laughs> a lot harder to read. But they did use rotunda for Latin as well. Um, and uh, this one is from 1340. And then we have Schwabacher, which uh, was, of course, the font of the Reformation. And we have uh, von der Befreiung der Stadt Konstantinopel. This is a, histo a historical text, right? And then Konstantinopel, die Stadt, ein Stuhl des orientischen Kaisertums, etc. So you can see, oh, that's the Umlaut right there, Stuhl. It goes, if it has, if it has, it's not a proper Umlaut, right? But they would put those on top of things. That's um, to make these long vowels, but it's not a proper umlaut. An umlaut would be like hua. Here's an umlaut. It has actually an e on top, um, and so an umlaut is actually that that vowel plus an e. So they used to put an e on top of the vowel. This one is says turk, and it has an e on top. So this is um, this will be gone by the time if you're reading a text from the 18th century or later, as in um, or even even probably a lot, this this putting the E on top was gone by the beginning of the 18th century. So um, you won't really have to worry about that if you're translating a text that's from, you know, 1700 and forward. Um, but this, yeah, that um, you know what an umla looks like. It's two the two dots, and back then it would have been the E on top, uh, the equivalent. And then we have um, Jesus zum Ersten, this is the beginning of Martin, one of Martin Luther's um, essays. Jesus zum ersten. So this is like for the first thing. And see, see, this is actually an S here. Zum ersten, dass wir grundlich mögen erkennen. So this is actually, see the little E on top right there. Was ein Christenmensch sei. Und, so the D has been left out. Und wie es getan they would leave out these ends sometimes. Um, so see, und, and then this dash, and there should be a D right there, right? Getan, there should be an N right there, but it's gone. And so the H is also not there nowadays. So um, this is obviously, this is the, the text as it was printed um, in the 16th century. So this is going to be very, very different from obviously what we have today, and also very different from um, an 18th century text that you might be translating for your exam. So, but it's always a, it, this is going to be way harder than anything you would need from the 18th century, but um, it's good practice because you will learn uh, to deal with uh, things that are very challenging with this, but we have the side-by-side -side later of uh, what this text is. And then we have um, to compare this one, and then now we are a couple of centuries later, 1846. So, der erste Teil von Dr. Faust's Versuchung und Höllischem Bündnis. So, you can see we have, uh, hopefully, this looks a lot easier to read, right? Uh, but for one thing, that the spelling has is, is a lot easier. Um, but we still have, the spelling is still different. So, this would normally be Teil without the H. T E I L. Teil meaning part. So the th is characteristic as one of the last spelling changes that uh, that was um, left over by the time we get to the end of the 19th century. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so at the end we have this text again and we will compare it to a regular font. Um, and then we have, for example, Mischung von Fraktur und Antiqua. So um, this is also from that same Faust legend. And what's happening here is that we have the uh, fraktur, this is all the norma fraktur, but then um, what, what's happening in the story is that uh, we're looking at uh, these these words in other languages come up, right? 
persischen, arabischen, griechischen Worten. So, um, uh, he's talking about words from other languages, and so when they quote these words, um, the, when these are these are Latin words uh, that are sort of cited in the text, and when Latin words show up, uh, then they just get put into Antiqua because it's a Latin font. So, um, you know, they did have, they the printers did have other fonts in other drawers of fonts, so they would just do that to indicate that these are Latin words. And so in English, when we use, um, or in, in, in contemporary English, sometimes when we're going to so all of a sudden use words in another language, we, we did italicize them like this, you can see. And so um, that would have been their equivalent of italicizing it to indicate that it's another language. Okay, so let's go through the letters and familiarize ourselves with the letters so we can feel more confident when we get to them, when we encounter them in the wild. So um, the A is like a Faustus, a lowercase a, a Faustus, and then uppercase a, um, abend. This is abend. So that one is a little weird looking if you're not used to it. Abend. There's the uppercase a. And then the B is like this one, berühmter. So that one's pretty normal looking, I think. And then this is bank, ba, and the B, I think, is pretty easy. And then the C, uppercase uh, C, is Christi, Christi of Christ. And then here's another uppercase C, Krakow, the city. And then the, here's the lowercase C. It looks a little strange, but I think it's recognizable. Krakow C right there. Uh, you're not going to get a, the Cs you mostly find in, um, there's like SCH, right? Uh, but in general, um, German uses K's more often than C's. Um, and then you have, here's the D. Yeah, so the D, the lowercase D, you definitely have to get used to a little bit because it's, it looks like it's sort of leaning over. It's about to fall over and it's got a very short tail on the top there. And then the uppercase D, I think, is pretty recognizable. Then um, all of these examples are from the mid 19th century text that we were looking at. Um, so here's the, here's the lowercase E. Um, and then here is the uppercase E, Entschuldigung, Entschuldigung, eh, right there. So it's, it's pretty fancy looking, but I think it's recognizable, Entschuldigung. It, it looks a little bit like an F, right, but it's really an E. And then the F, the lowercase F does take quite a bit of getting used to, especially uh, in when it's near an S, right? So here is Für, F, U, um, not R, Für. Oh, you can also see in the mid-19th century where we're getting to our regular umlauts as well. Um, so, für, and it's really subtle, but this um, this little knob on the front is very important. If it weren't there, it would be an S. So, this is, uh, for, for example, look in Faustus. So, this right here is an S. And the only way you can tell the difference between this long S and this F is the little knob at the front. Für. Faustus, so that S and that F, just a tiny knob. And then here's the capital F, I think looks recognizable once you're used to it, but it looks a little bit like a J as well, or yeah, that's the capital F. And then we have the G, so the G is I think pretty easy. This is Bogen, Bogen. And then here's capital G, Gleichen. So the capital G is pretty fancy looking. It looks a little bit like an O as well, but it is a G. Gleichen. And then we have the H, so gehört. This one is gehört. So it's a it's a little bit embellished, but I think it's recognizable. The the tail comes quite far down this way. And then the capital H I think is a little bit hard. Heren. This one is Heren. So capital H, it looks just like a big ornate version of the lowercase h perhaps. Yeah. Then we have the I, so this is Fia, the number four, Fia, so the I is pretty easy. But then the capital I looks very much like a J. This is Indeem, Indeem, and the reason it looks very much like a J because it's the exact same letter. So the capital J is, this is Yara, Yara, Indeem. So you have to just know based on context whether you're dealing with a capital I or a capital J. Um, but they, they were just seen as the same letter back then. They weren't, um, you would see the spelling with both ways. Um, so this is Fia, this is Indim, and this is the lowercase j for Yidatzeit. Yida, Yidatzeit. And you can hear the 
the how the J and the I sound the same. Yeda, like Yeda, Yeda. You can try to say the I. Imagine if this were actually an I. It would be Yeda side. Yeda, Yeda. It's really very, very, pretty much the same sound. That's why. So Yare is the capital J. Yeah. And then let's look at the K. So the K, of course, is is a little um, hard at the beginning because it looks like a T, I think. So this is bunk. That's a K. And so you see the K has an extra, it has an extra couple of things coming out of the top. So this one is sometimes when they get printed, they, they mush together a little bit depending on how much ink was, uh, how saturated the ink was on top of the, the letters. Um, so these ones are kind of growing together a little bit, but these ones are more separated. But you can see there's there's three little knobs on top, and then it has a hook on the bottom as well. So this is bunk. This is ecken, so C K. And so um, a lot of times in German, the C appears with the K, right? So E C K E N ecken, which means corners. And so um, because they appear appear together so often, they're sort of seen as um, they're seen as one letter. Um, you know, in Spanish, actually, the CH is seen as one letter as well. Like, if you see the alphabet written out, C, there's C and there's H, but the CH is its own separate letter as well. So I think that's what's happening in Frakturschrift here. Some of the letters, they're just seen as a unit sometimes. So they're written um, touching each other. This is Ecken. And then this one is Kann, K-A-N-N, Kann. So this might be very... Um, uh, tricky if you don't recognize the word or if you haven't had experience with the K. It looks maybe like fun, which isn't a word, or maybe tan, which isn't a word. So that's the thing about uh, reading Frakturschrift is that the more German you know already, the easier it is because you um, you just know that some words, you, you would know that F-A-N-N -N isn't a word. That's just, but kan is a real word with a K. So um, the more words you know, the easier it is to tell what you can fill in the blanks even if the letter looks weird um, and then we have it's like a it's like playing wheel of fortune right if you're missing one letter but you have enough context from other things you can fill in that one letter without no even though it's it's a uh, you know missing yeah so this is comma which is an old word for chamber room or chamber comma so this is the capital K you can see the capital K looks a little strange comma Here's the L. This is Lieblicher. So we've got two L's in this one. Lieblicher. Lieblicher. So it looks pretty normal. It's got a it's got a branching at the top, but otherwise it is um, pretty recognizable, the L. And then here is a capital L. This is Lichtlein, which means little light. Lichtlein. So capital L right here. And then a lowercase L. Lichtlein. And then here's the M. We have comma again. So the M is, I think, super easy to recognize. It looks like a normal M. Um, and then the capital M is a little strange looking. Um, sometimes, yeah, it has tails right here. And depending on how much ink uh, was going on, they can grow together sometimes. But it is basically a capital M like you would expect. This is mention. Mention. And you can see the CH are growing together as well. We'll get to those combinations in a minute. And of course, this is an S, mention, meaning people. And so you can see this This has to be an S because there's no knob at the front there. It, it's tempting to think that it's an F, but it's not an F because it's flat right here. If it were an F, there would be a knob growing out of the front of it there. Okay, and then we have Polen. Um, this is to show the N. So this is the lowercase N, it looks pretty normal. And then here's the uppercase N. This is niemand, niemand, meaning nobody. So yeah, uppercase N is just a big ornate looking N. And then here's an O. So you, here we can see the broken, the, the fractures. It's an O basically, but it's fractured. So this is sollte. So the S, the long S sometimes, it will have a, a knob at the back, uh, but it won't have a knob at the front, right? So sometimes it's more prominent than others. So you can see this is Obersten. So this is also an S. That's the same S. And so it doesn't, it has just barely a little knob at the back, and this one has a more prominent one. 
But um, where if it were an F, it would have a knob on the other side, on the front. So here's the O on Zwalte, and then here's the O on Ubersten. Ubersten. So um, you can see it looks a little bit like a D, perhaps, but it's an O. Yeah. You can see it's got that broken, it still has a, a brokenness at that same spot on the top left. Okay, so here's the P, Sprach. This is Sprach, so the P looks pretty normal, I think. And then here's the capital P, Polen. Polen, so this was a, that one does take getting used to, that capital B, it looks a little, or a capital P, I mean. It looks a little bit like a B, um, but it's actually a P. Polen, meaning Poland. Um, here is the Q, Erkwickung, this word is Erkwickung, E-R-Q-U-I-C-K-U-N-G. So there's the Q, doesn't, uh, doesn't show up too much, but there it is. And then this is Qual, Qual, meaning torture. So it's the O, but it just has a little bit of a tail, Qual. And then we have the R, so this is Herren, meaning lords or misters, <laughs> several men. So Herren, here's the R. I think once you get used to the R, it's pretty easy, Herren. And then um, here's a capital R, Regel, meaning rules, or r rule, yeah, Regel, capital R. Okay, now let's compare the S's. So here we have Faustus, and that has an example of both of them. So we have the long S, Faustus, and it has a tiny knob at the back, but no knob at the front. It, it curves a little bit, but there's no knob there. So that's the long S. And then we have the round S, which is more like you would expect an S to look like, Faustus. And then, um, so you're gonna see that long S occurs more often, that's like the standard one. And then when you have, sometimes you'll see this, this uh, the round S as well at the end of a word. Um, and then we have Zondan, meaning but rather, right? So Zondan, it's really tempting to think that this, that this is an F, right? Um, but if you, uh, the more experience you have with your vocabulary, you'll know that Fondan is not a word. Fondan, it's, there's no, there's just, it's just nonsense. So you think to yourself, well, Fondan, that's not right. Uh, but then you, then you think, oh, it's probably Zondan, right? So. Uh, and then here, here we have a capital S, Schrift, the word Schrift, which means writing or, you know, font. So, um, script, you could say. So here's the capital S. It looks like the S, except for it kind of curves the other way. It looks a little bit like a G, but it's, that's the capital S, Schrift. So you can, here's an F to compare to the others as well. This, this F got a nice big knob at the front of it, so it really is distinct from the S. That's a good, that's a really good F, yeah. Okay. Now let's look at the T. This is Tifa, Tifa, meaning deeper. So here's the T, Tifa. And then um, the, the T, capital T, is Teufel, meaning devil. Here's devil, Teufel. So this one is a little tricky because it kind of looks like an I, but it's the T. The I looks is the J, and this thing that looks kind of like an I is actually the T. Okay. Und, uh, we, here's the little U. So the, the U is not too bad, except for, you know, it's when you get uh, with the U and the N next to each other can be a little confusing, um, but they, they are distinct from each other, but sometimes you get them, a bunch of them next to each other, and you have to really take a moment to, um, to figure out which is which. And then um, Urkunde, which means document. So Urkunde, um, the capital U right here. So that one looks pretty normal. And here's a K, look at that strange K, Urkunde. And then here we have the V. So here's lowercase V, Fia, V-I-E-R, Fia. So there's the lowercase V and basically it's strange because it has this extra hook right here. And so it, uh, it, um, it like leads back to that first part. So it looks like an O kind of, but um, it's just a little extra hook, uh, but it just, Imagine that it's just this part where before that last hook. Yeah, so FIA, FIA, and then here's the capital V, uh, Versprechen, which means promise. So Versprechen, this one too, it has the same thing where the, it hooks all the way back around until it's touching sometimes. And so it makes it really, it makes it look like a B or something. 
but this is actually the V. Versprechen, the V, yeah. Okay, here's the W. Uh, wollte, wollte. So it does that same thing where it's, you can see the W, but then you see how it, it like hooks back around and it, it touches the previous part sometimes. And so that can make it look a little bit like an M or something. Um, but you'll see it's, it's quite different from the M because it actually has these loops at the bottom as well. So this is Wollte, wanted. And here's a capital W. This is Worten, words, Worten. And so you see the, yeah, the, the bottom part looks as you would expect, but then it's just so strange how it loops back around and touches at the top as well. So that's the W. And then we have the X. Um, so Alexander. And the X is, um, this top part looks normal, but then you have an extra little uh, loop going on at the bottom. Um, and then, uh, so this one had quite a lot of ink on it. And then here's a, here's a better one. This is, this is what the, uh, what it was, what it probably looked like more on the actual metal, uh, the actual metal piece. So, so this is then the extra loop on the bottom. It kind of looks like an R, but with an extra loop on the bottom, that's the X. Yeah. And then here's an example of the short S again at the end of a word. And then we have the Y, which is not too um, common because, of course, it comes in... Um, it's not really a German letter per se. It, it Words of Greek and Latin origin will use it, but then most of the time words... If they're seen as recent loan words, they're going to have the uh, the different font anyway. So um, they have to be older loan words to be written in the German font uh, with a with a Y. So this is tyrannisch, tyrannical. So T Y R A N N I S C H, tyrannisch. So that's the Y. It, it does look pretty strange, um, especially if it connects at the top here. So tyrannisch tyrannical tyrant right t y r and then it's really impossible to find a to find a, an example of the uppercase y so i have the kleist fraktur here for you so that's what it would look like more or less if you're able to find it but you know eventually you, if you look long enough but um it just words just don't begin with y's very often in german and if they do they're loan words that are going to be written in the antiqua script anyway Okay, so um, now we have the Z, and this looks sort of like a cursive Z, right? This is zu, just Z-U, zu. Uh, so it looks like if you were taught to do cursive, that's kind of what it looks like. And then here is the capital Z, Titan times, Titan. So you can see it looks it looks similar to the lowercase one. It's just it's just bigger and rounder, Titan. That's a Z, and then we have the A umnot. So it's the same. Uh, you can see it's just the A with the umlaut on top. But um, back then, uh, they didn't put umlauts on top of capital letters. They didn't have the extra letter for it in the drawer. So um, you, whenever you have a umlaut that you can't really represent, like for typological reasons, then you just put the, the E after it. So this is, this is a capital A and then E. Um, so A E, this is Epfer, right? Apples. So A E P F E L, Epfer. So this would be the umlaut on top, but it's just an E afterwards instead. Um, and then we have Schöpfer. So Schöpfer, S C H O umlaut P F E R, which means creator. Schöpfer, the creator. And so, um, yeah, that's the umlaut, umlaut, as you would expect. It's just an um with the umlaut on top. And then here we have Österreich. So here we have the capital O and then the E because uh, they couldn't print uh, the umlaut on top of the O. So instead, we're just going to get the E afterwards. Österreich, meaning, of course, Austria. And then we have the U umlaut is, as you would expect, this is Vyoda, which is of course Konjunktiv 2, the uh, I would do it, ich würde das machen, I would do that. So that's the U with the umlaut, as you would expect. And then the same thing again. So we can't, um, there, there wasn't an extra letter in the drawer to have the umlaut on top of the capital U, so they just put an E afterwards. 
Übermut. Übermut. Yeah. Okay. So then the S set, of course. Um, so this is the interesting thing about the S set. This is how you say the letter S set, right? S set. That's that's how you pronounce that letter. S set. And so most people study German for many years, not thinking about it. It's just called S set. That's the name of the letter. But what does S set even really sound like? It sounds like S and set. The letter S and then the word for Z, or the you know the way you pronounce the letter Z is set. When you learn to do the alphabet, you go A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, etc. Right. So the way that you pronounce these are S and set. It's kind of like Z in um, I think in British English they'll say Z, and so this is set. Right. So S set is actually S set. So that that's how you pronounce this letter S set. It's the you know the S and then the set. And what does this look like if you put the S and the Z right next to each other? It looks like an S set. See how it's this long part and then that's that's where this letter comes from is the S and the Z written right next to each other. So when you see the S set written in Frakturschrift, this that's what it looks like. It's literally just the S and the Z. Uh, put right next to each other. It's similar to how we had the C and the K right next to each other, the S and the Z right next to each other. So that is, of course, a DAS, D-A-S set, right? DAS. So sometimes, uh, even in later, it, you know, once they converted over to what we call, you know, contemporary fonts, uh, it would uh, it would be the S and the Z. So how do you how do you write S Z? Wie schreibt man DAS? D A S set. D A S set. So both of these are the same. D A S set. D A S set. Right. And so um, sometimes you get texts from like this one from the early 20th century, and it's written in um, you know what we call a Latin font. Um, and so you see this dust here. So this is a holdover from. Since this is like the beginning of when Germans were using these non-black uh, letter fonts, so um, it's like this transitional phase where these non-black letter fonts are so new, and so instead instead of using the double S, they were actually still using the S and the Z together, DAS. But today this would be D A S S, not D A S Z. So I, this is all very fascinating stuff to me. I hope you find it interesting as well, uh, where all these letters came from. So hopefully that remember, helps you remember the S set is actually the S and the Z, but nowadays it's actually the SS. It, it converted over to the SS, not the SZ anymore. So the S, the S set is the equivalent of the SS nowadays. So um, let's compare the long S and the round S. So here we have Faustus again, the long S and then the round S. And then we have Zondon, which is, of course, the, the S at the beginning, the long S. And then here we have minus Herzens. And so, see, we have the round S's at the end of the word. If it's at the end of the word, it's going to be the round S. And hopefully you can tell this is actually genitive construction. So this means of my heart. Minus Herzens, of my heart. That's why we have the S's at the end. Um, usually when there's an S at the end of a German word, it means it's genitive. And then we have also, meaning therefore or thus. So here's the, the A is pretty weird. And then the S is, of course, pretty weird as well. Also, A-L-S-O. And then here we have schreien. So this is the S, the long S. And then the C and the H are written right next to each other. They're sort of seen as... Um, a unit, and then R E I E N Schreien, and then the C. How we here we have more C H examples. See how they're they're um, because it's sort of one sound, right? This is Hochschule, so Hoch. It's really one sound, Hoch. It's like one. Uh, if you were to write this in the IPA in the International Phonetics Alphabet, it would be um, it would be just one character. It's one, it's not this, you don't pronounce the C and the H separately. They're the same. They're, they're just one sound. So that's why they're written together. And then Schule, here we have the C and the H written together. So you can see if you pick them apart, you can tell that they are written as they normally would be, except for that they're, um, they're just smashed into each other. 
And then here we have a, a capital, just to show you how it looks with a capital, is it looks normal. It's, there's a normal C and a normal H. So it wouldn't happen with a with a capital letter, just with the lowercase. So this is Christ. Christ. Okay, so here we have the CK. We had this one before where the C and the K are sometimes written next to each other because there it's only one sound, right? It's not two separate sounds. Erk Wirkung. So it's yeah, it's just a it's even in older spellings, um, that C wasn't even there. It used to just be a K. If you go back before the 18th century, you'll see just the K in in um, in situations like this. Okay, and then the TZ. This one's pretty pretty um, uh, tricky if you haven't seen it before. So this one is Zetste Zetste. So that's a S E T Z T E. So you can tell it's a T, but since it's right up next to the Z. It's sort of hard to tell that it's a T anymore, but it is a. So this is also a T, so it's T Z T. So this is a T and a, and a Z right next to each other. That's the, and this one is Vorsatz. So the the kind of a weird V, and then O R S A, and then T and a Z next to each other. So um, it's very similar looking to the S set, right? Because um, it would be the S and the Z next to each other. But the S um, has the hook uh, that comes forwards and the T doesn't. Right? Okay, now let's compare the F and the S because these are the trickiest ones that um, are often confused with each other. So we have, this one is freundlich, F. So you can see it's a F because it has the knob at the front, which is like the cross of an F. So freundlich, F-R-E-U-N-D-L-I-C-H. And this one is auf. So the F, uh, this is an example where you would really have to, because als is also a word. It could be alf or als. Those are both prepositions, right? And so um, you have to be able to tell that it's F by the knob at the front, alf. And then this one is zondon with the same S, uh, long S. And this one is zaina. And now this is a tricky one because faina is also a word. It would be like um, the adjective for something that's fine or you know, um, uh, of, of high value or something. So, um, yeah, the, this, but this one is actually Zaina and you can see there's no knob at the front. There's a little knob at the back, but no knob at the front. So it's Zaina and not Fina. And then I noted before the capital I and the capital J are the exact same. So you just have to be able to tell it based on context, which is which. Um, and then we have the T and the K can sometimes be confused. So Tifa, there's the T, and then Kan with the K. So um, when you see the T on its own, it's it's pretty easy, the T itself, because you wouldn't really mistake that for a K. But then when you see the K on its own, you might think it's a T, right? It looks, the K, when you don't have another T around it, could look like a T, but it's really a K. Kan. Okay, so then... Uh, let it, let's practice reading. So I'll show you the word and give you a moment to pronounce it, and then I'll pronounce it. So übung lesen Sie vor. Read aloud. So what is this word? This is gewesen, which is the past participle of sein to be. So G E W E S E N. A tricky S there. It's a long S. Gewesen. Yes, this one is Luft, L-U-F-T, Luft, which means air. And so um, imagine if we had this S instead right here, that would be Lust, which is actually a word as well. So um, either, you, uh, either way, it could exist either way, but this one is Luft, which means air. Okay, next one. So this is Erwachte. E R W A C H T E. So the tricky part of this one is maybe the C H, right? Erwachte, which means uh, woke up. Okay. This one is tat. So the t the H is silent. T H A T. It looks like that in English, but it's not that in English. It's tat which means um, it's a past tense. In, so nowadays it would be T-A-T, -T, which is the simple past of tun, to do. 
So it means like did, taught. So next we have Zondon, so meaning but rather, Zondon. So the S, the S is trying to trick you into thinking that it's an F, but it's really an S. Okay, next one. This one is Dwufta, so that D is a little tricky at the beginning. Dwufta meaning was allowed to, it's a simple past of the modal verb Dwufen, so Dwufta. Next. Zornig. This one is Zornig, or you could also pronounce it Zornig, depending on dialect. So Z-O-R-I-N-G. Zornig. So Z, like a little cursive Z. Okay, next. This is Geist. Geist. So G-E-I-S-T. So of course we get the long S in there, and it's very tempting to say Geift or something, but it's actually Geist, long E. And then the G, you just have to get used to that capital G. Capital G is very common in German, so um, hopefully you can practice, um, find enough practice on the capital G. And then next one. This one is Hüfe, H U umlaut L F E. And this is actually the old spelling. So today this would be Hilfe with H. Today it would be H I L F E, which means help. Um, but back then it was Hilfe, H U umlaut L F E. Yeah. This is Vasa, so W A S set E R. And so the S set is the equivalent of an S S. So um, after the spelling reform of the 1990s, uh, they determined that the the S set, this character, only comes after long vowels and that the double S comes after short vowels. So this would be, that's why this uh, is technically wrong today because um, vasa, a, this is a short vowel sound, vasa, short a. So because of that, we would do double S here today, not the S set. But uh, phonetically, they're the same sound. So W A S set E R means water. Okay, next one. This is hören. So H O umlaut R E N. Hören meaning to hear. Next one. This is können. So to be able to. It's a modal verb, right? To be able to. So können, and of course the tricky thing here is that's actually a K, K, können. Okay, next one. This one is Katzenschwanz. So that's a K, the K is a little tricky. The capital K looks a little bit like an R maybe, but that's the capital K. And then the T and the Z are written right next to each other, Katzen. And then here's the long S, and then the, the C and the H right right next to each other, and then that W with the k parts of the top connecting, Schwanz. So this is K, capital K, A, T, Z, E, N, S, C, H, W, A, N, Z. Katzenschwanz, which means cat tail, the tail of a cat. Okay, next one. This is sehen, meaning to see. So you can see that's the long S. It's got a knob at the back, but not at the front. So it's an S, not an F. Sehen. Okay, next one. This is Affen, which means monkeys. So der Affe is one monkey, and then die Affen is plural monkeys. So um, that's capital A. F F E N. So um, you see, they can tell they're F's because there's a knob at the front right there. Often. Next one. This is kalte. So that's a K. And then A L T E. Kalte means cold and it's got an adjective ending as well. So something feminine coming after it. Kalte. Okay, next one.
This is Eada, E-R-D-E, -E, which means Earth, capital E-R-E-D, Eada, the Earth. This is Augen, capital A-U-G-E-N, Augen. So uh, that means eyes, like your, your, um, in your, in your head. <laughs> yeah. Augen, your eyes. Yeah, Augen. That capital A takes some getting used to. Okay, so then we have uh, to compare these two. Uh, this is the activity to um, compare the um, the two types of fonts and compare with the way that it's written today. So this is the beginning of Martin Luther's, Martin Luther's essay um, uh, about some Christian mention, right? Um, and so this is the beginning. Jesus, this is the spelling from, this is uh, 1520, right? So not only are we getting the font from 1520, we're getting the spelling from 1520. And the spelling was quite different. So Jesus with a J-H, and then that's the long S, um, and then the short S at the end of the word, or the, the round S, you could say the long S and the round S. It says, Jesus zum Ersten, dass wir gründlich mögen erkennen, was ein Christenmensch sei und wie es getan sei, etc. So I have that um, typed out for you in, uh, it, this is still the old spelling, so the spelling is going to be the same. It's still a very weird spelling, but um, but at least the font is you know as is um, a modern font, so that you can at least tell what which letter is which, right? So I would um, as as a final exercise, you can compare these two and make sure you understand uh, each. So you read it to the best of your ability, and then when you find one you don't understand, you go check and see what it is. Also, you see this is so old that they don't even capitalize the nouns. Um, look at all these nouns not capitalized. This is Freiheit, meaning freedom, and it's not capitalized right there, which I think is very weird. Um, this is um, so that B at the end, this would be just U-M, that B disappeared. Um, so this spelling is very strange. So many words in this text are going to be spelled differently today. But luckily for your translation exam, you're not going to have to translate anything this old. Um, for your exams, um, they will be something more in this era. This is the mid 19th century, or you know, this is this is how it looked in the uh, both the 18th and 19th centuries. So this is Dr. Faustus is eines Bauern Sohn gewesen uh, zu Rot. This is uh, it, it's sort of um, the printer um, missed it right here, but I have it here. Zu Rot. It's a um, Sometimes they just, they aren't printed very well. Anyway, there's just a little spot missing there. Um, but they shouldn't have that on your exam. Um, but, you know, it was not an exact science back then. Um, and if, I'll, I'll be able to see on your exam if there's something like that wrong with it. And then, of course, you wouldn't get any penalty for that. Um, so you can compare these two. Um, it's the same text, but I typed it out. And um, hopefully you feel a little bit more confident in reading the Frakturschrift after that and please write me an email whenever you have any questions about how to read that. Vielen Dank, I hope that was useful und wir sehen uns nächstes Mal. Tschüss, auf Wiedersehen.